this video we'll be talking about Rett syndrome. Rett syndrome is a devastating rare genetic neurological disorder and this affects the young females more than the males. So its prevalence is approximately 1 in 10,000 live births. So it's not that common but it's a rare genetic disorder. In 90 to 95% of the patient diagnosed with Rett syndrome, the disease is caused by in a loss of function mutation in the MECP2 gene. In a moment, it would be clear that what is the disease pathology and what has MECP to do with that. Anyway, MECP2 gene is located in the X chromosome and since uh, MECP2 is important for several brain function, in this particular disorder, the neurodevelopmental aspect is abrogated. There are several hotspots which has been identified on MECP2 gene which are mutated. So Rett syndrome was first observed and described by Andreas Rett who was a neurologist and based on his name it's known as Rett syndrome. So there are several symptoms like repetitive hand movement like whining, clasping and tapping etc. So this is very typical. Uh, to Rett syndrome. Also, behavioral symptoms include social withdrawal, avoidance of eye gaze, and many other things. So, loss of purposeful hand skill, such as ability to grasp an object, is totally compromised in this particular disorder. And along with that, there is repetitive and obstructive hand movements. There is regression of acquired motor and social skills learned in early childhood. There could be difficulty in coordination, walking and balance. Many of them require a wheelchair. There are breathing rhythm abnormalities. Both inspiration and expiration rhythms are not really um, coordinated in this particular disease. Then there is a chance of seizures and totally social withdrawal. Now let's talk about the neuronal phenotypes of Rett syndrome. If we consider a normal patient versus normal uh, individual versus a Rett syndrome patient, the overall brain size is reduced and this kind of situation is known as microcephaly. So smaller brain size is pretty common in case of Rett syndrome. Neurological features are also altered in the red brain patient. If we look at the neurons, especially the pyramidal neurons, they have elaborate dendritic network. But the Rett syndrome patient's neuron are more simple and the dendritic complexity is reduced. And also the functionality of these neurons are altered. They have more shorter and stubbier dendritic spines, which are sites for synapses. Anyway, MRI findings suggest that there are specific brain regions, such as the parietal lobe, and the temporal lobe which are heavily affected in Rett syndrome patients brain. So basically their volumes are decreased in this case. Now common defects in Rett syndrome includes delayed neuronal maturation and synapse formation. So even if there are neurons the complexity of the neurons is less and the way they connect to each other that is again dif uh, different compared to the normal brain. So the no connections are not normal. In order to perform any behavior, the neuronal architecture and the synapses has to be formed in a meaningful way, which is really messed up in syndromes like Rett syndrome. So basically, these patients so shows stunted head growth between two to four months of age, and they are diagnosed with acquired microcephaly. That means during the time of birth, their microcephaly was not apparent, but eventually within the age of two to four there is microcephaly and these are kind of like early symptoms of neurological involvement. The main symptom often begin around 12 to 18 months where arrested cognitive and motor development is noticed. Also the loss of acquired verbal skill is another stark feature. So within two to four months and 12 to eight mon 18 months of the birth these uh, signatures are apparent. <coughs> now this is how a normal scenario versus a Rett syndrome scenario look like. In normal condition, neuronal progenitor would differentiate into an immature neuron and the immature neuron would participate in synapse formation to create a functional neuronal network. 
In case of Rett syndrome, the differentiation process is faulty. That means the neuron which is produced is not really normal and it cannot participate in, fun uh, in synapse formation and in a circuit formation in a normal way. So often the cortical circuits that are formed in Rett syndrome is unusual. Generally, in any circuit, there is an excitatory and an inhibitory component. And this excitatory inhibitory balance ensures the circuit activity is not too low or not too high. So this activity is kept in kind of like a balanced fashion. But in Rett syndrome patients, there is a, a breakdown of these homeostatic processes that lead to over excitation of the synapses. And this is one of the key cause underlying Rett syndrome. Question is, which cell types in the brain are affected by the Rett syndrome? Are these the excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, or the glial cell types? Scientists are bothered with this question for a long time, and I'll tell you how they try to solve or try to understand that. But anyway, at a molecular level, MECP2 is basically known for its role in transcriptional repression. So it interacts with NCO-SMRT complex and repress the transcription with the help of histone deacetylase or HDAC. Anyway, when MECP2 is not there, many of these repressors are not able to assemble. That simply means the genes which are supposed to be repressed and important for normal development is now derepressed. So wrong gene expression at wrong time, all this lead to lots of complications. Anyway, scientists used a genetic system known as cree P system to understand the role of MECP2 in different cell types. They use cell type specific promoter and try to knock down or, or knock out or delete MECP2 in specific regions of the brain. For example, they can delete it selectively in excitatory neuron or inhibitory neuron or let's say any glial cell type like astrocytes. And each time they ask what has gone wrong and how that can be reversed. So just to cut a long story short, short these kind of uh, adventurous trajectory led the scientists to understand that MECP2 regulates an important molecule known as insulin-like growth factor or IGF-1. And that operates via PI3 AKT signaling or MAP arc, uh, MAP kinase signaling to ultimately assemble PSD95 proteins on the postsynapse. So this postsynaptic density is modulated by MECP2's action via IGF. So obviously in Rett syndrome, when MECP2 is not there, IGF1 is not activated or produced. That lead to a problem in the PSD95 density in the synapses. That means synaptic formation is not proper. This kind of fundamental research has led to the first discovery of Rett syndrome drug. So imagine a scenario where there is a patient with Rett syndrome, so obviously MECP2 is not there. So ideally, there should be no pathway to produce IGF-1. But in this case, IGF-1 is given from outside as a format of oral solution. So it actually triggers the downstream processes and lead to the proper synaptic formation. And this particular drug is known as DEBU, which is basically a synthetic version of IGF-1. And this is now FDA approved. So now, unlike many other neurological disorders, Rett syndrome has a medicine. And all this discovery came on the shoulders of fundamental basic research. So I hope this video was useful. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe.